2 Samuel chapter 9, if you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 9, then we'll take up our offering. I'll read these 13 verses and then we'll take up the offering. You want to, you can, if you want to sit down, you can sit down. 2 Samuel in chapter 9. Familiar story about a man by the name of Mephibosheth. It says that David said, Is there yet any left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? For there was in the house of Saul a servant whose name was Zeba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Zeba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any in the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Zeba said unto him, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Zeba said unto him, Unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Michor, the son of Mihel of Lodabar. And the king David said unto the to fetch him out of the house of Mechar, the son of Emiel, from Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, that restore thee all the land of, thy, of the Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Lord, we just praise you and thank you for the service. We ask you, Lord God, that you would move bodily and bountifully here. Lord, we just sense your presence tonight, Lord God. And just ask you, Lord, that you would flow up down the pews of this church, Holy Spirit. That you would work in every heart, including this preacher's. Lord, that you would move mightily and bountifully. And that the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would have full supremacy. That your word, Lord, would be lifted up and highly lifted up, Lord God. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. You know, in this uh, ninth chapter of Second Samuel... It speaks of a man by the name of Mephibosheth, who was the son of Jonathan, who Jonathan was a, the best friend of King David. They were close. But Jonathan was also King Saul's son. And King Saul was the departing uh, king, and King David was the incoming king. And we have preached on it many times, but King Saul lost his kingship. And King David was now taking over. And King Saul and his son Jonathan, and along with some of his other family members, were fighting against the Philistines. And the Philistines were causing havoc. And in that battle, King Saul and Jonathan, David's best friend, died. At that particular time, the Bible says that Meshebophet was about five years old. He was five years old, and as he was in the midst of uh, his maid and, and the other people who were taking care of him, his nurse said that the fighting was too intense and she decided she got uh, scared and she ran. And as she ran with the baby, he fell at five years old. And as he fell at five years old, he became paralyzed and his feet could not move. His legs would not go anywhere. And so he became disabled. And they didn't have wheelchairs back in them days, so he just had to make good with what he had. And that was just people helping him. So all his life, there was a man that was the grandson of the king, who was the son of, the, of Jonathan, who was a good friend of David. And he went through his life, and he, as he went through his life, he was a prince of sorts. But he was also a man fully acquainted with the hardness of life. He knew what it was like to have troubles come his way. He knew what it was like to have his dreams not come to pass. He knew what it was like not to be able to walk like the other people. To have people make fun of him because of his disability, so to speak. 
People were looking at him a little strange because of his situation. And they looked at him and said, well, there's nothing that's going to come of his life. He was a man that was full of disappointments. He was a man that knew what it was like to have difficulties come his way. And he also knew what it was like to have adversity in his life. He was a man that had to overcome many obstacles in his life. Even though he was the prince, he was looked upon now as the kingdoms were changing. As a man that was even less favored because his dad was gone, his grandfather was gone. And there were even some that would have thought that it was good to get rid of him because he might try to bring rebellion into the house for what happened to his dad and his, and his, da his dad and his grandfather. But Mephibosheth was taken care of. The Lord had taken care of him. And he was, as we had read, near Gilead in the high places, and he was being taken care of there. And David had made a covenant with Jonathan. The Bible clearly tells us that they loved each other very much. And they were very close friends. And although Jonathan was Saul's son, he knew David was of God. He knew his ministry was going to be of God. And he knew that the kingship was going to be of God. And so Jonathan made a covenant with David that they both agreed to. That there would not be any harm or danger come to them because of what's going on in the, in the situation. David, of course, was hunted down by King Saul. He ran and hid in caves. You read through the book of Psalms. We've woven in and out of the Psalms as David's fight for his life, how the king wanted to kill him, and how the king wanted to, to do him in, and how the king had opportunity to kill him and, and missed him with a javelin at one point, and other times, David had the opportunity to, to put a javelin right into Saul, but he wouldn't do that because he was God's elect. So there was something in David's character that would allow him to be like other people. Was David perfect? No, David made a lot of mistakes. David was only human. But David loved the Lord. And as he loved the Lord, he learned from his mistakes but he also made some good points. And in the Bible verses today, he says in verse 1, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, after Jonathan died, he could have reneged on the covenant and said, Well, I don't remember the covenant anymore, or the covenant's been broken because Jonathan is gone. But no, David said, No, I'm going to still honor that. That's a man of courage. It's a man of character that would do such a thing. And so he inquires. And he talks to a man by the name of Ziba. And he says, yes, there is one man. There is a, a man by the name of Moshebophet. And as he was, at David, Jonathan's son, David says, you know what, I'm going to show him kindness. Uh, I'm going to show him kindness. And in Hebrews 12 and 24, we also have that uh, covenant with God. In the New Testament, we also have a covenant with Jesus. Because the New Testament is the new covenant. And Jesus is coming to our life in the same way. And it says, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant... And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Jesus is our, our mediator. And so David had a, a covenant with Jonathan. But you and I also have a covenant with God. And that is the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our covenant. We also see of David's kindness and his grace to allow the Shebelfet to be able to sit at the table. It says in the word of God 
that he would be able to sit at the table. In verse 7, and David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at the, my table continually. You know, David didn't have to let this man be at the, at the king's table. And trust me, being at the king's table was not an easy thing. You just didn't go to the king's table and won't be allowed to sit there. You had to be invited. You had to be somebody. And nobody sitting at the king's table would never have worked. You had to have something. There had to be something special that the king would allow you to be even at the table, to even be in his presence. But you and I have, have that same privilege with the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I could be in his presence. We could feast on what he feasted on and we could be with him. We could know him intimately. We could know him as our Lord and as our Savior. You just can't take him as your Savior. If you, if you want him just because you want fire insurance, you'll never have it because unless you take him as Lord, it's a package deal. He not only wants you because he wants to save you, but he wants to use you. He wants to grow in you and he wants to make something of your life. He wants to give you opportunity that you never had. He wants you to see beyond your difficulties. He wants you to see beyond who you are. You see, we have our own man's viewpoint on who we are and what we think we are. We have dreams, we have visions on how far we think we can go. But I tell you the truth that Jesus has things well beyond those things with you and I. You and I think this is all the farther we're going to go. This is all we're going to be able to do. But the Lord Jesus Christ thinks otherwise. It says here, as Mephibosheth was bowing down before David to show reverence, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Mephibosheth didn't have a high viewpoint of himself. Self-esteem was something that he didn't have. He didn't think that he was worthy to be even in the king's presence, let alone be at the king's table. He saw his father die. He saw his grandfather die. He saw the kingdom fall apart. He saw himself in a faraway land. And he wondered what was going to be left to him. He thought of himself as a dog. The least likely person that would ever be able to sit at the king's table. The less likely person that would ever be able to eat the bread off the king's table. And have the fruit off the king's table. And the meat off the king's table. He thought he wasn't worthy. He didn't think there was no way. He was humble. There wasn't any pride or arrogance in him to say, oh, I, I deserve to be at the table. Oh, yeah, I'm the grandson of King Saul. No, he looked at himself as to what he really was. He was just a mere man at this point. Riddled with all sorts of physical difficulties and disabilities that would keep him from ever achieving the things in life that he wanted to. But wait, that's exactly what God looks for that's exactly what God was looking for you see he thought of himself in a way that was not good but James 4 6 says but he giveth more grace wherefore he said God resists the proud but giveth grace unto the humble if you come to the Lord humbly and you come to him humbly and say, Lord, I want to be saved. I want to be out of this lifestyle that I'm living. I want to be out of this life that I have. I want to become something in life. I don't like where I am. I don't like what I'm doing right now. But Lord, I know I've heard rumor that you could do so much more than I could ever dream. In Ephesians 2.10, that there are works prepared for us in advance for us to do. 
And we only get to achieve that whilst we know him as hold as Lord and Savior, and we allow the Holy Spirit of God to resonate within us and to teach us and to train us to do those things. And so we know that this is what God does. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And many people will miss heaven. Many people will miss heaven because they're just too proud. They'll never bow a knee to Jesus. They'll never bow a knee to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm just telling you just the way it is. They just can't be honest with God and say, you know what, I lost everything I have. I've got nothing here to refer to. I've got nothing left other than a couple of shiny quarters maybe in my pocket. But the Lord says, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a start, and if I got a start, I got something to work with. I heard a doctor that was in charge of the Betty Ford Clinic where all the celebrities go. And they pay tons of money to go to this Betty Ford Clinic for alcohol and drug abuse. All your celebrities go there. All your people have got a lot of money go there. And the, the channel, the ABC News reporter said, so uh, where does it start with these people when they're on their way to recovery? And what separates them from the people that never recover? He says, well, they come in broken and they come in humble. Then I got a chance. But until they do that, they'll never recover. They'll never overcome their addictions. Confessing things to God is something that should we, we should do anyway because God already knows. He's just looking for us to say. In Micah 6 and 8, he says, He, showed, he has showed me, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what God requires for us, just to walk humbly with him. Mephibosheth decided that he was going to walk humbly with the Lord. With David and the Lord had blessed him. And I, I, it says here in verses 7 and in verse 9, and it, it, the king was going to restore his land. And Jesus had said in Ted, John 10, Ted, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus restores unto us much more than just the land that we lost before we were saved. He gives us a life, but not only life, but more abundantly. He gives us something that we can't earn or deserve. He feeds us off the rich table of his, of his loving kindness. And he bestows upon you and I grace to be even be at the table as he had shown but David showed grace, a measure of grace under the fellowship that he never thought he would ever get. And I suppose that the fellowship was happy just to be able to be in the, in the land that he was living in and that he was just content with just writing out his life, just thinking that this was all that was going to be left to me. That he was going to say in Lodabar, and in Lodabar, that was his whole life. He probably gave up on every dream he had to think that there was something beyond Lodabar. But yet the Lord shows us in these verses that he is rich in mercy, and he uses David to be able to say that. And so Mephibosheth is able to sit at the king's table. And the same grace that David bestowed upon Mephibosheth that he did deserve, that he didn't earn, that he should have never had gotten outside of the loving kindness of God. We too, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace, salvation, none of it's ours. None of it's something that we earn or deserve. It was something that was given to us. Undeserving sinners that were headed for a devil's hell. Undeserving sinners who didn't merit, didn't earn. In fact, we looked the other way and Christ didn't want to have nothing to do with them. 
There's not a single man that says, I keep to the Lord. And there's not a single man that said, when I found God. Because first of all, God wasn't lost and we weren't looking. We all went our own separate ways. But Christ died on the cross for us nonetheless. And we've been given a covenant with the Lord through the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ himself became our sacrifice as I preached last week. And we too are at, the, at a table for the future time. Hey, we're not going to be just at King David's table. We're just not going to be at that table just to be able to eat and to be able to have bread. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, there is a future in the book of Revelation that talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we as the bride of Christ who know Him will be in white and we forever will be with Him. And there is this special union that we will have at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation, it's 7 through 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he that saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. You and I that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior got a fantastic future ahead of us. We not only have the assurance of heaven, we not only have the assurance of a forgiven debt of sin, not only able to walk in the newness of life, but we're also given heaven. And in that heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will sit at the table with Jesus. And Jesus does not a respecter of men. He doesn't care how much money you got. All he's looking for is if your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Have you humbly come before him? Have you humbly submitted your life to him? Have you humbly asked him into your heart? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you asked him to make you as white as snow? He can only do the regenerating. I, I can preach it. I can teach it. I can articulate it. But not a man in his place that can save your soul. That work is only done through Jesus. The Holy Spirit will convict you. The Lord will save you and the Father will honor it. But outside of that you can't be saved. And you can't be saved unless the Lord calls you. And he's calling you like he called my fellowship. He's calling you to the table to be able to sit with him. He's calling you to the table to be able to be with him. He says in verse 8 of our passage. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I? Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But God, who was rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, quickened us together with Christ, for grace you are saved. Another passage says, You are my friends, in the book of Hebrews, it says, You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not the Lord doth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made unto you. This is the book of Luke, I'm sorry. But you have not chosen me, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that, you, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. We were dead in our sins, but Christ has made us rich. Because at the time that we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, there is a rejuvenation process. We were dead, spiritually dead. We come to him with absolutely nothing, but the Holy Spirit brings life, brings an awakening into our hearts that we may know him. And that we're not only just servants 
as Meshebopheth was happy just to be a servant to David. Just to humbly come before him and say, I'm your servant, I'm yours. But Jesus Christ says to you and I, he says, no, 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 no. You're not a servant, you're a son. Fellow sons, heirs to the very kingdom of God. You're not just saved, you're just not having the fire in church. But I've got something more for you to do. And the inheritance of heaven that we receive, we understand that the Holy Spirit that comes to live within us is that inheritance of the future time when we will be in heaven. And the Lord will work it to us now. And everything about us now helps us on the way to heaven. We don't think about death. Death is something that doesn't even enter a Christian's mind. Oh yeah, you think about as far as making sure you're proper and everything is ready to go, but death has lost its sting for the believer, amen. Sting has lost its death because we don't think about those things. And we don't have to think about those things because we have a Jesus. We have, a, we have the New Testament covenant with Jesus. And he's the one that made it. We didn't ask him to go to the cross. In fact, we probably would have spit on him and made fun of him on the way to the cross. But nonetheless, he went to the cross on behalf of you and me. He didn't ask us if we would accept him if he went to the cross. He just went ahead and did it out of his love. For God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We weren't looking for him. We didn't want nothing to do with him. We were humble. And we just cried out in, in the midst of our tragedies, in the midst of our difficulties, like most of us did that know him. I'm looking at jail time. I'm looking at, looking at that crazy jail from my house. I can see it almost as I take a walk. Don't know how many months I'm going to be there. Don't know how many years I'm going to be in there. Don't know if I'm getting the wrong judge and I'm going to spend my time in prison. I don't know that. I have no idea how long I'm going to spend. But the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life and I ended up with a year's probation. And that was God. And you can see God in every part of a Christian's walk. How he faithfully allows things into your life for reasons, but he also helps you with things. Yes, David was a, a type of Christ. And everything that you see, David, in this passage pointed you to Christ. But David was an earthly king. And as an earthly king, he only had the ability to do what a man was able to do. But the Lord Jesus Christ looks upon you and I on a whole new level. Looks upon you and I and says, we're so much more in his eyes so much more gentlemen he's not concerned about your past he's not concerned about what you did he's not concerned about why you are why you are not concerned about any of those things he just will accept you and receive you just as you are he knows your difficulties he knows your struggles he knows everything you've been through he knows your highs, he knows your lows, he knows your ins, he knows your outs. But yet he still calls you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He still calls you to the supper to be able to eat with him. It don't matter what you did. The fellowship came to him humbly. And he came to him just being honest about himself. Realizing there was nothing within himself that deserved to be at that table. And he saw the grace of David allowing him to be there. And you and I, they're going to be at the same marriage supper of the Lamb, that same marriage table. You and I are going to be standing there with the same thoughts in our mind. Lord, we're not worthy to receive salvation. Lord, we're not worthy to have our sin death forgiven. We're not worthy of those things. But we praise God that you allow them by your grace and your mercy. We praise God that you allow them to be sold. 
We praise God that before the very foundations of the world, that you and the Father and the Holy Spirit work it all out, that the Lord Jesus Christ would come at the exact time that he came to be able to die for the sins of mankind. And like Meshebophis, he came humble. He realized that God was doing a work in his life so far out of the realm of what he thought. Later on, David is being hunted down by his own son Absalom. And Ziba, the guy that we were talking about here that was the servant, he stabs, he verbally attacks Meshebophet and lies about him to King David, dishonors Meshebophet and makes a lie, just stabs him in the back, just throws him under the bus. It says, you know, that Meshebophet is working on taking over the country. He wants to take over the kingdom. He doesn't want you to be king no more. He wants to overtake it himself. You can read that in 2 Samuel chapter 16. And David's worn out, he's tired, he's depressed, he's going through anxiety, just running from his own son that wanted to kill him. And like I had preached previously, a lot of his own people that he entrusted, even in his family, his leaders, military, and in the parliament, and everything that were supposed to be helping him turned on him. And so he doesn't know what to believe. And in 2 Samuel 19, we read in verse 24. Nineteen and twenty-four. And Meshebopheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes, from the day that the king departed until the day that he came back again in peace. David was being hunted down, and the, the day that David left. And the day that David took off because his son was trying to kill him, Meshebopheth identified with David. And he loved him. And he loved the fact that his grace, the, David's, the grace of David was poured upon him. He says, I'm not going to take a shower. I'm not going to shave until I see the king again. I'm not going to do anything until I see the king. And the king does return. And the king stands before him. And that... In that day, to stand before the king without your clean clothes on would have been grounds for killing. It would have been an execution right away because you're not, you're, you, it's, it was illegal to be in the king's presence without clothes, good clean clothes on, without a shave. You had to look right. You know, you wouldn't go to the White House, not washed, uh, didn't shave your beard, and, you know, look like you haven't done anything in months. I mean, you would do whatever you could to look good if the president invited you. And so Meshebopheth was there, and he was all broken up, but he was happy to see David. And he explained to David that Ziba had lied, and that he really wasn't trying to take over the kingdom, but he had to prove himself. And David had to test him to make sure he was his own. And God does the very same thing with us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he'll test you to see if you really love him. Do you really care for him? Will you, will you really identify him with him? Will you really let the hard times that you go into, would you really will stay with them rather than just give up and go back to your whole life? Meshibopheth said, I'm going to stay with you, David. And we too, when we go through hard times, we stay with the Lord. We don't buckle up from underneath it. We don't renege on our commitment to be with David. But we look at David as we look at Jesus Christ. And we say, Jesus, you've done so much for us. You gave your life on the cross. You have nail print hands. You're God. You're the second person of the Trinity. You gave your life as a ransom for us. Us as undeserving 
people who don't deserve it. Don't deserve it. And His grace and His mercy are available to you tonight. He looks upon every man here today and says, examine your heart. Are you in the faith? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you were to die today, would you know where you're going to spend eternity? Do you know where that's going to be? Because it don't matter what you think, it matters what the truth is. Because if you think you can work your way to heaven, you just fooled yourself. It's only through the blood. It's only through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's only through the finished work that Jesus Christ did. Grace is extended to you today, gentlemen, who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to receive Him. But God's not a fool. He won't keep on giving you something that you don't want. You'll eventually say that's enough. The same grace that was poured upon Mephibosheth that didn't deserve to be sitting at the king's table is being offered to you tonight. Tonight you walk in as an unregenerated man who doesn't know where you're going to spend eternity, doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but you can walk out of this place a saved man. You can walk out of this place and know Jesus Christ personally in your heart. You can only know, you can know that, you can have the inheritance, you can have the works that he has prepared for you in advance to be able to do, you, and you can have your neighbor in the last book of life, and you can have that marriage supper of the Lamb that we're talking about ready for you. I was talking to a man that graduated from your life skills program last week, and I knew him driving the van, picking up the van on Sunday mornings for church. And I see what he's doing now, and it's so far out from what I ever thought God would ever do. And uh, if I mentioned his name, you probably would know. Some of you that have been here a while would know him. But he's doing fantastic. And he's not doing fantastic, and he told me over the phone, Brother Mike, I'm not doing fantastic because I, I, I got talent or I got a gift. I'm doing fantastic because I just see the Lord's hand. I just humble myself before him, and I just see the Lord just opening doors. Because he bowed and kneed to the Lord in humility. And he said, God, I have nothing to offer you. I'm low. I'm a dirty old dog. I've got nothing. His family kicked him out. He's got nothing to live for, nowhere to go. But the Lord took him into his family because he always will and changed his life. Let's bow our heads and pray. I know that there are men here today. You've been thinking upon the Lord and thinking about the good things of the Lord but are just waiting for an opportunity to be able to receive him into your heart. For you, gentlemen, that's, today is the day of salvation. If you want to come up front, I will pray with you to receive Christ. Now, it's not magical. It's something that's done in your heart. It's your heart that tells the Lord if you want him or not. Words don't mean much, but they do. But it's your heart. And for some of you, I, I, just, I just plead. Knowing that the coming of the Lord is soon, knowing that we know, I have no idea how long our life is yet to live, when we'll take our last breath. My birth father in ICU on his deathbed I said, Father, you need to make a decision for Christ. My, my biological father, I said, you need to make a decision for Christ before you die. Because once you take your last breath, you're done. And he died a minute later, right in front of my eyes. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord God, for the cross. We thank you, Lord God, for the passage of a shovel fifth. And Lord God, how you used him and King David as an example of Christ. 
how Christ is able to save the lost and the dying, how Christ is able to move mightily about the fleet in a man that doesn't deserve your riches of glory. But Lord God, you've extended those and well beyond that to us and so much more for us as human beings in the New Testament covenant. We ask you, Lord, we ask you right now, Lord God, for these who do not know you, Holy Spirit of God, that you would bring a conviction upon their hearts that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior of their lives. Lord, we ask you right now, if there is any man that does not know you, Lord, that they would cry out to you. Father, we ask you right now that you would touch every heart. And I pray if there's any other men that have prayer deeds that they can come up and I'd be more than happy to pray for them. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to work mightily and bountifully in every man here. We pray it in your holy and precious name. Amen.